I could not have found myself on a map if I tried. But perhaps it was just as well. Because I couldn't have found the Dewdrop Cafe on a map either. For over an hour, I had been driving down the same road without coming to an exit, or even any signs of civilization. The road was edged with thick woods, covered in lush kudzu. The only illumination was my car's milky yellow headlights. I was on my way to my sister's wedding and wasn't in the best state of mind. But I reflected one never is when attending a wedding, especially alone. I watched the murky midnight landscape flow past the car window like a dirty river. Lights and colors were hazy, and almost everything was tinged green. I hadn't anticipated the length of this drive. If I'd had to ballpark it, I would have said the route from Pensacola to New Orleans was two and a half hours. I'd been going for almost five. How much further would I have to drive down this endless, dark highway before I saw anything? Anything at all? I thought about pulling over to get some sleep. Beyond my headlights, beyond the edges of the rain-slick road, there was only a wild thicket of trees and vines and shadow. I started looking for a break in the heavy wall of vegetation where I could pull in and hide the truck. There had to be some kind of dirt road, a trail, anything. And then, I saw shafts of light. Warm light, golden almost, filtering through the trees up ahead in fragile rays. I slowed as I approached. A small dive bar? No, too well hidden. Someone's house? I pushed my curls out of my eyes, squinted. My interest was certainly piqued, but I was cautious. I had been dubiously led astray by boredom before. The source of that light could be a charmingly secluded bed and breakfast, or a shack filled with shotgun-toting holy rollers. But as soon as I reached the lights, and the rays fell through the side window, bathing my face, stinging my eyes, I saw the break. It was a small, dusty road studded with small, gleaming white objects, like pearls. But they couldn't possibly be pearls. Shells, most likely. I hesitated, then directed the truck down the dirt road. What the hell, I thought, any port in a storm. The road was incredibly rocky, and the truck and all of its contents seemed to rumble down. I couldn't see much ahead of me, just the unpaved road with its thickening cluster of shells. The oak tree limbs closed ahead, lacing through and through, until I felt I was passing through some kind of leafy tunnel. When I lowered my window, I was struck by the immediate, intense scent of roses. I quickly rolled the window back up. The scent was too strong. It had seemed to invade my senses, blotting out my nose with sweetness, coating my tongue with venomous nectar sliding around my eyes with thorny tentacles. Suddenly, the headlights met the warm light, and together they illuminated the swinging tavern-style sign upon which the Dewdrop Cafe was emblazoned. The cafe was a little building with a high-eaved roof and many windows. The walls were river rocks, smooth pebbles that glistened in the humidity. The cafe was bordered on the right by thick forests, and on the left by a tented produce stand. Beyond the stand, I saw what must have been a large garden, filled with glowing white roses. I felt drawn to the quaint place. Jasmine vines twined through the rocky facade, and around the lantern sconces on each side of the door. But it was the door itself that intrigued me. Its stained glass window was impossibly intricate. Red crystal roses, linked with silver webs, studded with iridescent dew. I parked in front of the cafe in an attitude of indecision. Light shone through the varicolored facets of the stained glass window, and I thought I heard the low hum of many voices beyond. Surely there would be coffee there, 
maybe a little bite to eat or some espresso would perk me up enough to get to New Orleans. But most importantly, I could get some directions. Just as I opened the door, the cafe door swung open and someone came out. This person beckoned with a flashing white hand and bright smile. I waved back, smiling too, my deeply ingrained southern manners rising, even as I became uneasy. From afar, and even as I approached, I could not tell this person's gender. The person was quite young, stood tall and lean, and wore misty blue jeans and a loose white sweater. Their hair was full, thickly curled and white as a lamb's down. The hazy golden light struck a halo around their head. You're open? I asked. The youth sidestepped and gestured inside. Of course. Welcome to the Dewdrop Cafe. The heavy floral scent outside faded as I entered. The walls were the same inside as outside, bare river stones with vines, but these were lined with flowering mosses. A cool mist seemed to radiate the walls and gather under the sconces. The place was like a cave, I thought. I could not help myself and spun around slowly, looking all around. In the far corner, silvery chimes winked, a fountain bubbled, and glass globe terrariums slowly swung overhead. Windows all around bore the same roses as the front door except those in the far-back alcove, where black wrought-iron tables and chairs were arranged. On one side, by the entrance, was a bar, backed with glass shelves of hundreds of bottles in every conceivable size and color. None of them were labeled. On the other side were plush green velvet couches, tossed with many silk scarves and cluttered with old leather books. Please have a seat wherever you like, the youth said. I'll bring you a menu. Uh, sure, I said. I went over to the alcove and sat at a table by the largest window. The pale green curtains were drawn tightly. When I sat down, the sound of voices seemed to press against the glass. I lifted the curtain inquisitively, only to be stopped by a cry from the other side of the room. Sir, the youth called, please don't do that. There's a private party in the courtyard outside, and it would be best if they didn't know you were here. Before I could inquire as to why, the young waiter hurried out a nearby door, leaving me totally alone. I sat quietly, my hands in my lap. I was confused by this, of course, but I let the confusion roll through me. I looked around the cafe once more, and something struck me as familiar about it, as though I had seen it before, in a dream. I tried to shake off the feeling, glancing down at my watch. Half past midnight, the witching hour, I thought, and that made me smile. I don't know why, but it felt genuine. I watched the mist gather under the sconces again, and it gave me a strong sense of tranquility of peace. It was like being out in nature, like being at my parents' lake house, like catching fireflies and minnows and rushing through whispering grasses, being a child again. I wanted to close my eyes, but I was not sleepy anymore. Soon the young waiter was back with a thin, polished plank of pale wood, carved with words and edged with moss. Have a look. Won't you, sir? Sure. I took the plank, light as paper and smooth to the touch. The menu was double-sided, with one side in English and the other side in strange runic letters. I took a moment to study those and ran my finger over their sharp grooves. What a uh, language is this? I asked. That? That's Futhark. Futhark? I nodded. Okay. I made a brief mental note to look that up later and scan the English side. 
Most of the dishes appeared to be vegetarian, and the vast majority were desserts. There was squash flower salad, honey jelly with candied rose petals, pumpkin soup, barley bread with butter, blackberry scones, roasted watermelon, rosemary lavender cookies, and a number of other dishes much more bizarre and harder to pronounce. To drink, there was coffee, of course, and every tea imaginable, along with spiced cider, blueberry mead, elderberry liquor, nettle wine, and honeyed milk. The choices were overwhelming, and reading the description of some of these things made me unbelievably hungry. Coffee, definitely. Big cup. And, uh, what would you recommend, I asked. The question seemed to amuse the waiter. What is it you most like? To sing? To dance? Or to sleep? Uh, what? The waiter was patient. To sing? To dance? Or to sleep? I laughed outright. A dance, I guess, I said. The waiter nodded, taking the menu. I know just the thing. Then, with the slightest hollowing of the waiter's cheeks, I knew he was male. Once again, quite impossible to know why, but I was certain. The waiter suddenly knelt and reached below the table. I jumped, but the youth came up with a handful of tiny red-capped mushrooms. I stared, then looked under the table. Indeed, there was a small ring of the little fungi around the table, and a small mound of them in the middle. I had not noticed that the floor was earthen. When I glanced up, the waiter was gone, and I was alone once more. I chuckled. What the hell? I whispered, but I was in a remarkably good mood. There was music outside and laughter. It seemed to rise and fall like whispers carried on the wind. I tried to focus on the music, but it escaped me. Ribbons through my fingers, drums and violins, harps and bells, and other instruments I could not name. I heard the rhythmic tapping of many feet on a dance floor. A woman squealed with delight. I looked around the room to be sure the waiter was gone. Then, I lifted the curtain just so and peeked out. Outside, there was a vast courtyard edged on three sides by thick woods, illuminated by a chandelier hanging from an overhead branch. There were perhaps a hundred people outside, clothed for a masquerade, dancing in a great circle. Women wore great full gowns or silky slips, gossamer and satin, velvet and brocade, beads and lace. Men were dressed in floor-length cloaks with ragged edges, tunics red and green, glinting silver and glaring gold. Through all the color, I could see a pattern. Green jackets were embroidered like leaves, red skirts cut like petals, Hair teased like the clouds or flowing like water. Masks glittering like gems or roughened like wood. It was all to do with nature. But it was the masks I focused on. The masks themselves were all elongated. The noses, the ears, the cheekbones. And covered with leaves, feathers, flowers, or beads. My eyes settled on one woman whose mass was covered in lustrous raven feathers, and then on a man whose mask had great antlers painted gold. A woman in a lilac silk sheath of a gown and pure silver mask stopped to catch her breath and turned to see me. I glimpsed her eyes, impossibly pale, a jasmine flower fell from one of her blonde braids. She raised a hand and waved at me. I was transfixed and leaned closer to get a better look. I nearly fell out of my chair when I heard the waiter cry out again. Sir, please don't do that! The waiter pulled the curtain from my hand and arranged it fretfully over the window again. I felt dazed 
as though I'd just woken from a deep sleep in a vibrant dream. I had to physically shake my head to rid myself of the sensation. What? I managed. Why? The waiter set down a large bowl of pumpkin soup and half a loaf of fragrant rosemary bread, but still held the cup of coffee in his hand, clutching at it with the longest white fingers I had ever seen. Sir, did they see you? Did they notice you? Uh, a, a girl, she saw me. But what's the big deal? The waiter shook his head quickly, pursed his lips. His expression of pure dismay was almost comical, like a child's. He put the coffee down in front of me and crossed his arms over his chest. Please, sir, I'm telling you this for your own good. Whatever happens, whatever they say, no matter how much they tap at the glass and call you, do not go out there. Do you hear me? Do not go out there. With that, the waiter went to the back door and locked it. He tapped the tip of his nose and then quickly left the room. Now I was uneasy again. I picked up the curtain and pulled it aside to find the girl was gone. Now a man was staring at me, clad all in muddy brown, with a tree bark mask and squat red acorn-like hat. His mask only came to the bottom of his nose and I could see the man's wide smile and sharp little teeth. Spooked, I dropped the curtain and turned to my meal. The pumpkin soup steamed up my glasses. I hadn't realized how cold I'd been before then. I laid a hand on the rosemary bread, warm as a hearthstone. Then I dipped a fluff of bread into the soup and ate it. I was dizzy again. The soup was heavily spiced, and along with sweet earthen pumpkin, onion, garlic, nutmeg, and allspice, there was something bitter. Beyond this, I couldn't tell. There were too many layers to it, and the bread was the same rosemary and black pepper, thyme, honey, butter, and that same bitter ingredient. Impossible to really dislike, I noticed that despite the intricate flavors and numerous spices, and there was no salt. But I didn't care. I ate greedily. I was finished before I even took notice of the coffee and found it hot and rich. It had chicory in it, New Orleans style. Cinnamon and almost too much sugar. Its warmth filled me with contentment. And I could almost forget the sight of so many people dancing in a circle. And one man with sharp teeth, staring only. At me. I sipped at my coffee for a while longer, wondering where the waiter had disappeared to. I was totally comfortable again and felt a peculiar pang of sadness when I thought that I should leave soon. Then there came the lightest rapping on the window pane. I eyed the curtain warily. If it was some kind of masquerade party, surely someone had come in something scary. Long teeth. Made sense. Wouldn't hurt to take one more look, would it? I had lifted the curtain before I knew I had made the actual decision to do so. The dance went on wildly, and I noticed that everyone was barefoot. One man was hopping from one foot to another and crying, Thorns! Thorns! A woman nearby took up the chant, and everybody began to mimic the man, laughing and bumping into one another. A woman with a dress torn over both shoulders shouted in a language I couldn't identify. Two men, both wearing red hats, stumbled out of the circle in tandem. One of them turned around, and they both saw me. They had the same sharp smiles. They cried out to the company as a whole, chanting one word over and over. It sounded a shade or two off the word, fair. Many of the company turned and followed the men's gazes back to me. A frisson of excitement rippled through the crowd. Some waved, some whispered to one another. The music paused and a few dancers fell out of step. 
the red-capped men with a few others approached the window. They raised long-fingered hands and cooed to me. Behind masks, I saw strange, hungry black eyes. I didn't like that. I didn't like the way they went to the window and not the back door. Soon, they pressed their hands against the window. I wanted to look away because these enchanting masqueraders were turning into something horrible, and I didn't know what or why. One of the red-capped men clacked his nails against the glass, and with the other hand reached back to pull the string of his mask. Come out, he rasped. His voice was brittle and whistled like an autumn wind through dead leaves. Yes, do come out, a woman said, drawing near. Come be with us. Have a dance, another said. And a drink, chimed yet another. Come outside. It's no pleasure to be lonely, is it? Tell us your name. The first man dropped his mask, and I instinctively closed my eyes. Colin, the man hissed. My name. Oh, forget this. I dropped the curtain, pulled out my wallet, and headed to the bar. Hey, waiter? Hello? The waiter appeared from under the bar, his white curls sprinkled with beads of water and tiny leaves. Wow, um, okay. How much do I owe you? The waiter shook his head. A name and a wish. He replied, What? Your name. First, what is your name? A shiver circled my stomach. What do you want to know that? There was no response, so I quickly lied. Uh, William. William Grant. The waiter lowered his eyes with a smile. You do have some wisdom, Mr. William Grant. Now tell me your wish. What is it you want most? Why? Don't think, just speak. I was about to drop a 20 on the counter and the hell with it when the word came out of my mouth against my will. Love, I said. I covered my mouth, astonished. I thought it was a hiccup. The waiter nodded sagely. Then you are free to go. Take this. He pressed a folded piece of paper into my half-opened hand. Directions out of these woods. You are headed to New Orleans, aren't you? I didn't answer. I hurried out the door. The air outside seemed to kiss my skin, and I sighed with relief. Until I saw the sky. Peeking over the treetops, the palest glimmer of rosy light. It was almost dawn. I checked my watch. Almost 6 a.m. I turned back and stared at the cafe incredulously. How the hell had I spent more than five hours in this place? It had only felt like half an hour or so. I almost tripped getting into my truck. I pulled away and only then looked at the paper the waiter had given me. A simple map. I had little choice but to follow it. I hoped it would lead me as far away as possible from the Dewdrop Cafe. But still, all the while I felt the pull of it. All the while I heard that raspy voice saying my name. Sunday afternoon, New Orleans. I had made it two days ago and had helped my sister prepare for her wedding. I hadn't had a lot of time to wonder about the Dewdrop Cafe or what had really happened there. I had to be there for my sister, the last living member of my family, and without a doubt, the closest to my heart. When I had walked her down the aisle, veiled and giggling, Amy, little Amy, I forgot myself entirely. Amy and I had practically raised each other after our parents died. We had moved from one relative to another until some inevitable disaster relocated us. We had seen the deaths of two uncles, an aunt, and our grandparents. I could remember one night when Amy had cried herself to sleep because she thought we were cursed. I told her the next day that I didn't believe that, and I wouldn't, not ever. We just had bad luck, and it would pass soon. And somehow or another, it did. 
We came into some money when I turned 18, and we both headed to college. Soon, Amy was engaged, and within a few months, she was here in a storied plantation on a sunny afternoon. The reception was held under a large white tent on the lawn, under ancient oaks and Christmas lights and violet skies. Guests danced to the folksy music of a live band. I sipped strawberry champagne at the family table, while Amy twirled round and round with her husband, Brian. When she saw me watching, she waved at me. She was definitely drunk, I thought, and raised a glass to her. The similarities of this reception and the masquerade at the cafe were not lost on me, but I tried not to think about it. No masks here, no red caps. Here was a family, and although everyone was from the groom's side, they talked to me and Amy as though we had been part of it all our lives. I polished off my third glass just as an exhausted man collapsed into a nearby chair. I'm getting too old for this, the man laughed, dabbing his forehead with a handkerchief. You're the bride's brother, right? Colin, he said. Yes, and you're one of Brian's uncles? One of six. So, great wedding, huh? I'm Ronnie, by the way. I shook his hand. Then something occurred to me. Hey, you live around here, right? Born and raised Louisianan. Have you, uh, ever heard of this place called the Dewdrop Cafe? Ronnie leaned back in his chair a bit, eyes narrowing. Sounds familiar. Describe it. I briefly went over the look of the place, the river rocks, the stained glass, the earthen floors, and wrought iron tables. It was like a cave inside, I admitted finally. Ronnie stared at me for a minute. Then, slowly, he asked. The waiter was a kid. Maybe a girl, maybe a boy. And you thought you spent a few minutes there, but... When you checked your watch, a lot longer had passed? Yeah. I leaned forward, a little jolt of adrenaline in my veins. It was real, not a dream or a nightmare. I knew that, but it was so good to have it confirmed. You drove a long way for this wedding, huh? No, just from Florida. Why? Ronnie looked puzzled. That place was in Massachusetts. Never forgot it. It was somewhere outside Salem. Hey, Ronnie! Someone called from the dance floor. Ronnie got up, and I was left staring at the chair he'd left behind. Massachusetts, I thought. I had a feeling that place wasn't a chain. Soon the music changed, slowing, easing, and as couples made their way to the floor, I sat once again at the family table, to joke with Brian's uncles. During a break in the conversation, I scanned the floor for Amy. I didn't spot my sister, but I saw a sight familiar and foreign at the same time. She was swaying alone, arms around herself, eyes closed. Her lilac silk dress whispered against the ground, her blonde braids set with bursts of jasmine slid off her shoulders as she tilted her head to the music. It was the girl from the courtyard, the girl from the cafe. Her eyes opened. It was her, all right, and she was looking at me with the sweetest smile. I tried to be disturbed, even horrified that she was here, that she had found me, but I was rising. I was headed towards her, her cat-like eyes so large and just a bit too far apart, her lips dark rose and gleaming. She was so still, she was waiting. A couple passed in front of her, obscuring my view for a moment. I craned, but when the couple was out of view again, she was gone. I saw her the rest of the night, and she always disappeared before I could approach her or speak. She was dancing under the trees last I saw her, dancing, far beyond the tent on her own, even as the band was packing up. I thought dimly of what the strange waiter at the cafe had asked me. What is it you most like? To sing? To dance? 
or to sleep, to dance. On the road the next night, I thought of her, the way her white cheek was gold struck by the Christmas lights, the shine of her waist-length hair, the silvery shift of her graceful limbs in that dress. Why had she been at the wedding? If she had followed me, why hadn't she spoken to me? Why did I wish I had pursued her more? I had better directions leaving New Orleans this time, but I got lost again. This time, in the grip of midnight, the forest edging the road changed. There were no more magnolias, myrtles, southern pines, or kudzu. The forest was lit with such color it seemed aflame. Trees were bleeding red, winking gold. Their lights were broad and star-shaped. When I lowered the window, the air was brisk and smelt of smoking fires. I glanced at my watch. Midnight again. I wanted to pull over and touch the trees. None of it felt real. Bonnie's voice was in my head. Massachusetts, somewhere outside Salem. I rubbed my eyes fiercely. It was happening again, wasn't it? I was lost and helpless, and I knew the road would lead me right back to the Dewdrop Cafe. And perhaps, just perhaps, back to her. Sure enough, after a few more minutes, I came upon the same shafts of life, the same leafy tunnel, the same shell road, the same river rock building. The door was open. No one was there. I drove up as though magnetized. I left the truck, my feet pulling me to the door. A cold autumn wind surged at my back, pushing me forward. The scent of roses and jasmine assaulted me again. They gently spreading cool fingers over my face and neck. It was warm in the cafe. The moss was slightly thicker on the wall stones, and the curtains in the alcove were open, but nothing else had changed. It was as though I had never left. I breathed out steadily. There had to be some method to all this, but I couldn't make sense of it. I turned. The blonde woman smiled at me. The door was still open behind her, but I hardly noticed. I could not speak. What is it you wished for? She asked, taking my hand and leading me to the plush couches. What is it you desire most in the world? Love, you said as much. Her voice was mellifluous, light as sugared petals, fresh as a mountain stream. I ached when she stopped talking, absolutely ached. She plucked a flower from her hair and tucked it behind my ear. The brush of her fingers against my face made me shudder. The cafe was filled with the smells of pumpkin pie and cinnamon apples. I could have fallen asleep. What is this? I asked. Whatever you want it to be. Come with me and feast every night. Dance every night. You never need bother with this world, its death, its pain, or its fear ever again. She slid a finger under my chin. We can go from here. We can go to meadows untouched by man, to forests flooded with fireflies, to mountains that pierce the skies. Her laugh was tenderly indulgent. It's time for you to make a choice. A uh, choice? Yes. Will you come with me and be mine? I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to feel. I pressed myself into her neck, taking in her honeyberry scent. I was at the lake again with my sister, jars full of fireflies, and my mother called us back inside blueberry pie and laughter, the drowsing quiet of an autumn night, a fire in the hearth sputtering, crackling, going out. Would you like to know such a world, always? The fey woman asked. You can have this and more. Come with me and never leave. Never return to this world of loss and pain.
Yes. I wanted to say, yes. I was so sick of being lost, even when I knew where I was and where I was going. But then I thought of Amy. I pictured her in her wedding dress. No, I said, and the enchantment was broken. I got to my feet and tried to look away from her. I couldn't. I want to stay with you, but I can't just disappear on my sister or my life. The woman rose and the color of her eyes shifted with the light. She turned and headed for the back door. Wait, I called. Wait. I'm never going to find anyone on my own, am I? There's only you. She stopped but did not turn. I'll tell you my name if you want it. I said, Colin, my name is Colin. The woman's laugh was sprightly, and when she turned, she changed. Her cheekbones were high and sharp. Her eyes glistened black and iridescent. Her ears pierced through her hair, knife-like, and her lips were bloody red. Colin, she repeated. And with that, she was gone. I was out the door and back in my truck by dawn again. I laid my head on my steering wheel, breathing in the scent of worn, beaten pleather and faded cigarette smoke. When I raised my head, I was in Louisiana again. The dawn was unfolding behind my truck, an empty forest clearing. Soon, the road unfurled before me. But I wasn't headed home. I was headed to New Orleans to see Amy one last time. And after that, to Massachusetts. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that story. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll be around for the next hour or so answering questions or reacting to comments. The story in this video was written by a subscriber who goes by the name Crow. Crow has a blog called Crow and Moon Writing, where he gives fiction writing and editing advice. The link to his blog is in the description. The story I read here was an abridged version of the original, shortened just for length. The full story might be available on Crow's blog, although I'm not sure about that, so you might want to double check with him if you're interested in reading it. If you're a fiction writer and would like to submit an original fairy story to be narrated on the channel, please email it to me. My email is also in the description. Just a few quick requirements. I prefer stories written in the first person and please keep them between 2,500 and 5,000 words. Ideally, the story should be set in the real world as opposed to in a fantasy world and of course involve some sort of creepy encounter with the fae folk. I'm looking forward to reading your submissions. As always, I'm collecting your true fairy encounter story, so if you've got one, I'd love to read it. Please email it to me whenever you feel like sharing. That goes for fairy art as well. If you have any to share, please email it to me with fairy art in the subject line. Of course, special thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Thank you guys so, so much for the support you're giving this work. If you like this content and would like to support it, please check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description as well. Every dollar is really, really appreciated. Don't forget to comment below, like, share, and subscribe if you're new, and hit the bell to receive notifications. And until next time, this has been a visit from your scary fairy godmother. <laughs>